Okay? What brain state is that? Fun. <laughs> That's the easiest way to put it. What is it? It's a polymonic brain state. That's polymonic. Everybody in that audience is in the same brain state. Many one polymonic brain state. And I realized, I mean, I love the stones. But I go, I mean, it's like, it's like a journey myth. I go driving up to LA on a Friday afternoon. Oh my God. Hail Ulysses. Oh, yes. Another air is the brain, Olympic brain. Odessus. I mean, the traffic jams. At one point, the heat was 91 degrees. But it's worth it because that's what you have to do to get to the end of the rainbow and blah, 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 blah. And I realized it's exactly those moments. That's the gift I was giving myself. I'm giving myself the gift of that experience. Even like now, I'm like, God, that experience. Because I myself, I don't know about you folks, I don't go to a lot of sporting games. I don't go to many concerts. I don't go to Baptist revival ceremonies or whatever you call those things. But it's an incredible, uniquely fabulous brain state, way of being in the moment. It's unbelievable. I mean, do you guys go to concerts? Do you, do you, not much. Or other, other, other places where you get this kind of energy? Yes, where do you go you get that energy? Um, well, I used to go to concerts a lot. Okay. But um, uh, kind of like community oh. events, like they have a thing called the Monster Mass where they shut down like blocks of San Diego. And, oh, yes. And people were dressed up and they had people on stilts. And, and it was just fun. Like I can't remember feeling that much fun since like going to the circus. Wow, okay, okay, right. It's a very fabulously unique brain state. And, and we, as a species, it's a tribal part of us. We're around the campfire going, oh, yeah. no offense to Native Americans or whatever ethnic group I just insulted, I apologize. <laughs> but, um, this is on blue. But yes, that's a, that's a very primordial, very fabulous brain state. And that's why I give myself that. Where did they give? Play? At the Staples Center. Yes, indeed. So I am going to turn this off because we're going to, yes, for now. You're going to stay right there, I guess. I don't know what you're going to do. I'm going to pull you out. Bye bye. You're going to tell me I was bad for pulling it out without getting it out. Okay. Um, oh, one other administrative thing. Somebody be kind. You guys, dear people, have to give me feedback. It's important. Please do. End of class. Hi there. Welcome. Monday, the final will be due. Not this Monday, a week from Monday. Oh, it's a take home. Of course, it's, it's the ones you. <laughs> you saw. Yeah, yeah, your final's right now. Get out your pants. <laughs> Don't anybody look at anybody else's paper. Ha! Ah! And your whole grade depends on that. Your whole value is a human being. Never mind the therapist. Oh, God, it's just so foreign. It's so bizarre. <laughs> I morphed into that part, the dark teacher part. <laughs> Crazy. God, edit that part out. Jesus. Anyway, because you just look worried. I'm so sorry. You look like, oh, huh. well, actually, then you look relieved. Like, oh, that's right. Well, of course, it's a take home. <laughs> right now? Oh, my God. I hope you didn't study for it. Oh, my God. That's incredible. You were expecting a final. Oh, you dear lady. How's your, hand? How are your hands? Um, no, I'm fine. I'm okay. No, you don't have any. It will be super easy. Yeah, it's going to be. Oh, that's mm -hmm. funny. I, okay, well, I'm glad I didn't. Uh, you're helping me realize I didn't make it a thousand percent clear. I'm always late, so. No, no, we're, but, but anyway, okay. All right, all right. So, so you're going to take care of that, so we're good on that. And what do I want to do first? I want to. You missed a very cool polymonic state. Wasn't that a cool polymonic yes, state? Yeah. The yeah. stones doing brown sugar at the end. Oh. Where they go, yeah! That's a very cool polymonic steak. Oh, you went to the concert? Oh, God, yes, I went to that concert. <laughs> In fact, I'm probably going to go on the 20th, too. Because, because it, I, they're not going to ever do it again, let's face it. And that, by the way, that guy's nearly 70 years old. Wow. That he is kicking rock. And Keith Richards and those guys are kicking rock like that. Like nobody on the planet is so inspiring for us agetarians that are moving along. Oh, my God. This, oh, God. 30,000. Sorry? 
on May 20th at Staples. They're all over the place now. That's the, that was their kickoff concert to their world tour. That was their, they haven't con done a concert in five years or more. That was their opening right there. By the way, the way it opened, it was so cool. The lights go out, the big drums. UCLA marching band comes out doing um, Satisfaction. Oh, how cool. Oh, it was very cool. Uh, There's so many cool things about it. It was unreal, but anyway. But Polymonic State, I highly recommend it. It's a very cool, <laughs> tribal, primal feeling. Okay, um, let me give you some latest. This is, let's talk about cool. So I see this young woman in, trans, in life transition, just graduate college, is working for her dad and whatnot. Her mom, highly recommend, she, she sees a therapist in this life transition thing. So I see her a week ago, and she gave me permission, because it was so cool what she did. I said, can I, can, I won't reveal any, you know, identifying information. No, you can tell her parents can worry about her using too much alcohol, perhaps being an alcoholic and whatnot. So she comes in and, you know, first meeting, she's never been in therapy before, we're chatting, blah, blah, blah. So I, you know, we talk about the different parts, the drinker part, and her, you know, launching to the world part. We just a bunch of stuff. And I said, well, you know, an oversimplistic way of sort of gauging your level of uh, how strong the drinker is in terms of running your life is see if you can commit to a month of no drinking. Now, let me be clear. If you do it, it doesn't mean, ha, I'm not an alcoholic because I could go a month without drinking. It, that doesn't mean that. People, as you well know, stop and then binge and all kinds of things. If you don't do it, it doesn't mean, oh my God, I must be an alcoholic because I couldn't last a month without drinking. But it will give you some reference point to how strong that part is. And it'll be interesting when you're deciding, the party that says, no, I'm not going to drink, and then the other part that does, and that pull. And that'll be an interesting experience for yourself. Okay? All right. She comes in this Monday. She goes, I got a tattoo. I said, oh, do you, do you have a tattoo? She says, no, no, I've never had a tattoo. But I decided to get a tattoo right here. You'll, you, would, you would never in a million years guess what the tattoo is. I mean, it's fine. You'll never... <laughs> No, no, it's um, the tat. Yeah, right. <laughs> Bearstein. <laughs> You're like, fuck you, man. I'm in charge. There's something. Biker chick. 31. I said 30. The number 31. I said, like, 31. Yeah. She says, like, a month. Like, 30, like, the longest month. Like, 31 days. It's going to remind me as to whether I can go 31 days. And I'll look down and I'll think, oh yeah, I can do 31 days. And I went, that is brilliant. Because it's not just about drinking, it's about who's in charge. It's about living, well, of course they gave her the spiel about life's about you know, taking loving responses, life will care of yourself. And that's what that will symbolize. The 31 symbolizes to you that every day of your life is an opportunity to take loving, responsible, respectful care of yourself. That is so cool. Just so cool. Okay. <sighs> what other one? Did I, I think I did this one with you. I'm just throwing out a few couple technique things. Did I do the cotton ball wishes? Did I tell you about that one? It's such a cool little thing. So that's a little side, but I did that the other day. Oh, I, I would have brought a cotton ball. So you take a cotton ball. This is really cool, like a bedtime with a little pumpkin. And you go, let me give you a cotton ball wish. Let's wish for a unicorn dream. And the kid has their hand out. And you pass fly by breathing the cotton ball to their hand. And then they give you a wish. It's a really sweet, cool thing to do. And what else is going on when we're doing that? Nothing. Oh, absolutely. But the other part of it is three in. You betcha. It's a nice indirect way to breathe properly. Let me tell you one other just interesting kind of a side thing that came up. I've told you about this young, well now young lady that I started seeing when she was three. -ish. Her grandmother brought her in. I actually played with her and then I told you all that. She's the one who invited me to the father-daughter dance, that whole thing. I more and more have felt uncomfortable. I'm just going to sound so weird, but it's really true. Taking money 
because what happens is the, the grandma gives me in cash, I charge you $100, so that's a discounted rate. But it's always in front of the kid, and it just always feels slightly contaminating. I totally get, and I hope you all totally get, the need for some payment because of fairness and the fundamental principles of reciprocity and how important that is. So I have no problem about the reciprocity. But the rent-a-friend phenomena and that backlog is somewhere in the backlog thinking, yeah, well, would you do this if you weren't getting paid? Do you really, really care? It just, so I've always, I know you've heard this spiel, I've said, you know, won the lottery and blah, blah, blah. I would still be doing exactly what I'm doing. It's just we'd be figuring out a good cause for that reciprocal money to go to. See, it, it buys you the freedom of then not having to take care of the therapist in any way. That way I really can think, feel, say anything, do about anything, and you have to pay attention to me because I've, I've done the reciprocity. So I thought, you know, I might offer, I'm not a wealthy man, but I might offer that to them, and I want her to know. And then I thought, well, maybe the good cause should be her. Maybe we should set aside each time that money, and I guess I would take it and set it aside. And then whether it, you know, college, some great thing that's helping her take longer than to take full care of herself, it'd come out of that. So I thought that, that's what I want to do. I just thought that would be so cool. And I want her to know because I want, because I'm, I'm committed. So I called the grandma. I said, this is going to be really a weird conversation we're going to have right here. <laughs> but it's really been, bob because frankly, just this last time I saw her, she was really amazing. She, she said, you know, this is what we're going to do today. You can sit. I sit down. She needs, has a high need to have a witness. Remember, one of our functions is to be a witness. Name me anything, and I'll sing a song about it. I said, well, let's start with a big one, love. So she just starts doing a thing on love. And I said, okay, uh, heater duct. <laughs> I mean, let's go from easy to hard. Oh, my God, she started doing a thing on here. It was unbelievable. It was a bird flying by. Bird. I mean, she was, and, a, and wonderful, and some really clever lyrics, really smart stuff, philosophical stuff. It was wonderful. So at the end, when we left, you know, and the, my, the grandma said, I said, you know, I should be paying you folks money for the entertainment I just received. And that's what really got me thinking on all that. So, so I did talk to the grandma, and the grandma said, that's a wonderful idea, but I think she values the time more that she sees that I'm paying for it. I don't know that that's true, actually, but I'm not. Yeah, I, I love that expression. Like, nah, I don't think so. I, I don't think so either, actually. She now is 16. I saw her, started seeing her when she was three. I see her once a month now. Um, so I, but I'm not about to argue with the guy and get in the whole thing. No, money should go to her. No, it should go to you. No, I don't want the money. What? I'm not doing that, Dance. But I just want, you know, again, interesting ideas of how we do what we do. Um, and there's a lot of ways to do it. And, and the implications and the issue of commitment. Okay. Adolescence. <laughs> a mother passing by her son's bedroom was astonished to see that his bed was nicely made. Everything was picked up. She saw an envelope propped up prominently on the pillow that was addressed to mom. Oh, with the worst premonitions, she opened the envelope with trembling hands and read the letter. <sighs> Dear mom, it is with great regret and sorrow that I'm writing to you. I had to elope with my new girlfriend because I wanted to avoid a scene with dad and you. I've been finding real passion with Stacy, and she's so nice, but I knew you would not approve of her because of all her piercing, her tattoos, her tight motorcycle clothes, and the fact that she is much older than I am. Here's to you, Mrs. Robinson a reference that some of you might actually know about. But it's not only the passion. Mom, she's pregnant. <gasps> Stacy said that we'll be very happy. She <laughs> so good. She owns a trailer in the woods and has a stack of firewood for the whole winter. We, have, we share a dream of having many more children. <laughs> Mom, 
<laughs> Stacy has opened my eyes to the fact that marijuana doesn't really hurt anyone. <laughs> we'll be growing it for ourselves and trading it with the other people that live nearby for cocaine and ecstasy. <laughs> In the meantime, we will pray that science will find a cure for AIDS so Stacy can get better. <laughs> she deserves it. But don't worry, Mom. I'm 15, and I know how to take care of myself. Someday I'm sure that we'll be back to visit so that you can get to know all of your grandchildren. <laughs> Love your son, John. No, no <coughs> parrot would fall for that. No. Hang on, hang on. Come, hang on. Drum roll, please. Thank you. Oh, P.S. Mom. Come on, none of the above is true. I'm over at Tommy's house. I just wanted to remind you that there are worse things in life than the report card that's in my center desk drawer. I love you. Call me, call me when it's safe to come home. Isn't that terrific? God, bravo. Call me when it's safe to come home. I wish I would have thought of that when I was younger. So right to point. What was on your wall when you were 16 years old or 15 years old? What's on your wall in your, in your room? I still have it on my wall in my room at home. Um, cool. Posters of like Josh Hartnett and Eminem and uh -huh. um, <laughs> um, who else? Ryan, I don't know, a bunch of movie stars that okay. I thought were good looking. Okay, very cool. <laughs> I wasn't allowed to have any pictures of boys, so. Okay. I subscribed to Cat Fancy Magazine as a child. Cat Fancy yeah. Magazine. So I had okay. to pull out pictures of cats. <laughs> of cats. Very strange. And then I had a poster of Paula Abdul. And Paula Abdul. <laughs> okay, very cool. What did you dress? What did you wear? You're 16, uh, what do you wear? I was a punk rock kid. Punk I, rock yeah, kid. I had all the spikes, wow. everything, my docs. Mm -hmm. Wow, can you just see her in that? That's Do you have a picture? That's fantastic. And I refused to give it up. I had, my walls were plastered in posters of Rancid and The Clash and everything. Do you I still put it. them on every once in a while? Oh, Halloween? Yeah. Hell yeah. All the time. <laughs> the music, everything. Cool. It was my rebellion. What was important to you? When you were 16. Yeah. Right. What's important? What matters to you? to be able to be myself without being judged. Oh, wow, okay. To be able to be myself without being judged. Cool, okay. Somebody else, what was important? Friends. Friends. Driving. Driving. Your parents crazy. <laughs> you knew that was coming. Uh, what's the worst thing you did and you got caught at it? Oh, sneaking out of the house. What time? Like, one in the morning. Yeah, one in the morning. How did they you... Were, when I came back, they were in my bed. <laughs> they were in your bed? Oh, my God, that is very clever. That is smart, actually. I stuck out once, and I was right. so guilty. I just felt so awful, like, while I was out of the Where did you sneak, where did you sneak out I to? I to meet my friend, and I think we were, like, or like papering something. <laughs> ah, the little the social part of you doing the little. Okay, and where where where'd you go? And you felt so guilty. Well, I lived in the country, so I met up with my friend, and we were doing. We were just ro roading, off roading. Off roading. <laughs> Cornfields. Okay. Wow, really? Where in the country is this? Oh, back in Chicago. Chicago. Lived, I lived on twenty acres. So 20 like, acres, Chicago, you're off road. And this is a country western song. This is perfect. <laughs> Got your truck, your dog. Okay, okay. So, somebody tell us the worst thing they did that they did not get caught at. Smoke weed. You smoked weed. <laughs> That's the worst thing you did. And this was with friends and stuff? Friends. Mm -hmm. Right. At their house? Your house? It was behind the school. Behind the school? Oh, it does get a little more, shall we say, interesting. A little more. <laughs> Sorry, Mom. Well, you didn't get caught. What's that smell? Must be the chemistry. Must be the chemistry class. We had an alley called Burnout Alley. Uh, now, now the, should we turn this into a Marijuana's Anonymous group or something? Uh, hi, my name's... Yeah. 
almost every day for the first half of my junior year. Oh, wow. So what happened to the second half? Uh, my parents told me I could go live with my mom in Nebraska. <laughs> oh, wow. So that so you did do that? Go live with your yeah yeah, and then you stopped cutting class. You're different there. Because yeah. they well at the school where I went here, they only did attendance in the in the morning. Oh so oh, very smart. At like ten and just go. Okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Um, go ahead. I was with a band. We went to Hollywood, and wow. it was the first time I ever drank, and I didn't uh -huh. know how to drink, so uh -huh. I thought like Southern Comfort was the same as oh. beer. Oh, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> Not a lot of comfort. No. Not a lot of comfort that night, and no. it was very... You were, you were in the band? No, I wasn't in the band. I was just like... like with a groupie? Yeah. No. No. <laughs> I don't know. no, they were just my friends. Oh, God, you went to go so see... Okay. 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 Hollywood, and we'd go, but that was the first time I got drunk, and I don't know why I didn't know there was a difference between alcohol content and. Yeah. And I was like, really? Yeah, well. Psychoeducation like probably would have helped you. Yeah, well, it probably wouldn't have stopped you, but, but you would drank a little less. <laughs> Correct. Ed, what, what was important to you? You're 16, what matters? My friends. Yeah. Being, spending time with them and yeah. having their acceptance. Let me tell you, first time I ever kissed a girl on the lips. And this is not raunchy, but it's, it's classic adolescence. I was, a, in a way, a late bloomer. Certainly according to my kid and his buddies. Because I told them this story, and they were like, you were like 15, Dad? So I'm down at the shores. We're hanging out. <coughs> hanging out. After surfing at the fire ring, it's a, it's a foggy Saturday morning. I, I see it so clearly. Duke was one of the guys, and he was kind of a stud man because he happened to have a birthmark that looked like a heart. <laughs> right there. So he's a stud man. I've been wanting, I know this sounds so weird, I've been wanting to kiss a girl on the lips. And I know this is, this is yeah, it's ridiculous, but I actually practiced on my pillow. And it's pathetic. I know, it's pathetic. My poor, wet, goopy pillow. But anyway, don't take my pillow from me. I love her. So there are these two, pardon me, chicks in the next fire ring. There's nobody around. It's foggy. The waves are weird. And one of them was Linda. Duke says, let's go over there. They call me Canny, Volcan Can Canner, let's go over there. We're going to talk to those girls. And I look at this girl and I think, I'm going to kiss her. This is the girl I'm going to kiss on the lips. So we go over, we're chatting, and her name's Linda. And I got a plan. This is a plan. I mean, a good kiss takes a good, you got to plan this out. So it's the shores and there's Scripps Pier. So we're going to walk to Scripps Pier. I'm going to say something funny, something cute. She's going to, thank you, she's going to toss her head back. Say, I wish she would have laughed. God, how easy it is now. She would toss her head back. Wham, I'm on her. I mean, I literally had this all planned out. We're getting, the sun now is shining. It's a good sign, good omen. The fog's lifted. We're walking. Oh, my God, I swear to God, my palms are starting to sweat. <laughs> I didn't know about 3, 5, though. I go into deer in the headlights. Talk about amygdalation. I can't think of anything to say. Never mind something funny or cute. We're now at the pier. I haven't kissed her. We turn around. We're walking back. And I realize I only have X amount of yards, and it's all over. I managed to, I remember exactly the spot. It's where the stairs, here's the pier. It's where the stairs go down from the parking lot by Scripps. We call the Whoops, Whoops Cove because our buddy, when you're an adolescent, everybody's got a nickname. Canny, Whoop. I'm sure, do you have a nickname when you're an adolescent? Gusto. Gusto. You did not? No, really. No, that's a good nickname. Hey, no, how you doing? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> she, I say something. She just kind of goes, huh, that's enough. I'm on her. I mean, not big, woof, woof, not that foreign language stuff, French. Just bam, just a quick whoop on the lips. She looks at me. <laughs> Ew, what did you do that for? To this day, I don't remember anything after that moment. Uh, I, I, I just, I have no idea how I got back to the fire ring. I have, I, I just, it all goes blank after that. The screen just goes, because I was so like, traumatized. Thank you, thank you for the empathy. Years later, I was with a girlfriend. I, as we were in the same spot at night, actually. And I told her the story, and she says, we're going to do a redo. So I kiss her, she goes, that was great, do it again. Thank you, thank you. But obviously my hands still get wet. 
<laughs> I won't delve into your sexual you know, dilettantes. It's an adolescent. That, that's too much. But, but that is a factor, as we all know. That's the point of this, is in adolescence. That's huge, as you all know. And it's easier if you're same gender attracted now, as you well know, than it was, God knows, in 1966. I told you my men's to Dougie Archer, who had effeminate uh, mannerisms. And I mocked him once, Dougie, yeah, hey. Yeah. And I told you 40 years later, I made my amends so happily. It's much easier now. But that's, but I don't need that stuff. Adolescence is, oh my God. I also think it's the um, hardest population to work with, by far. You agree, why would that be? Because what? Working with the resistance. Yeah, they think they know everything, so it's kind of hard. And they're capable. They will go out, they, they will go out at 1 a.m. or 3 a.m. in the morning. Five-year-olds aren't going to go out at 3 a.m. or eight-year-olds. Or, I mean, yeah, or if they do, they, I mean, not that, but they might walk down the you know, street. But they don't do what adolescents do. Oh, my God. What was, talk to us for a moment about your adolescence, Shane. Well, for me, um, like my father really emphasized the importance of education. Uh-huh. So even though I had, had many privileges of um, going out for, um, had a real trust with my um, school classmates and whatnot, I decided not to go to any of the uh, field trips at all because I didn't want to miss out in class. Wow. And so I avoided all the possible field trips I could attend. Oh. I'll take you to the museum. Oh. <laughs> and in hindsight, I, I felt a little bit bad. Yes, I regret a lot of that because I could have been having so much fun. I could have joined the sport. I could have you know, done so many things. But uh, I guess you know, I had so many trips, but not that much. Yeah. Well, maybe it helped get you here, and now you can have fun. I mean, it's, that's interesting. That's the other, other side. So what, so what did you do wrong as an adolescent, or whatever the term would be? If you want to say, if you're willing to say. Oh, you? No, yes. <laughs> you. I'm looking. Yes! Me? You think I did anything wrong as an adolescent? I didn't do anything wrong. My adolescence? Yeah. I grew up in a very strict household. Um, <coughs> I was youngest of four, but way youngest, so my mom wasn't working, so she just focused all her attention on me. So she was all up in my business all the time. <laughs> so I didn't really have much of an opportunity to do anything wrong because she was there. One time I lied and said I was going to a football game and went and did something else with my friends, and I got walked uh -huh. in the car and screamed at. She was very strict. Oh, wow. So I was, it was like the scare, I don't want to do anything because I'm going to get yelled at. Oh, okay. So. So, has, so has the part of you that would have wished to do something wild and crazy ever been allowed to do that? Have you allowed that part of you? Well, I think it's also my personality. I'm right. I'm not really a risk taker. I think right. it's like a combination of her and my own. Yeah. So. Okay. No. Okay. Tasks of adolescence. What are the tasks? What are they connected to? Because remember, one way to look at development is what one is connected to. Because as you know, we don't just connect to people, we connect to concepts and all kinds of things. What are the tasks? Identity. You betcha. Identity. Independence. Which involves being independent. I love this line. I love this line from this 14-year-old I saw. Her dad brought her. She looked like little orphan Annie. She's got the red hair, literally, and the little freckles and the whole thing. Cute little 14-year-old. Why did he bring her? And this again, this was years ago. Because he caught her, I'm sorry, not to be crass, boinking a 25-year-old on a Sunday afternoon in her parents' his and his wife's bedroom. Oh, wow. oh, precocious little pumpkin. And it was like a movie scene. The guy was pulling up his pants and running out the window. As the dad didn't exactly have the shotgun, <laughs> but similar kind. So she was so spunky. Oh, my God. was She was spunky. She would hitchhike. They lived in Poway. She would hitchhike with her best friend at 2 in the morning to 
OB, to the OB peer. Hitchhiked to the OB peer because she loved hanging out with those guys. They were just so cool. And then she'd get a ride back on a motorcycle so it's in time so she could get to school. What? Right. Huh? A lot of working with adolescents is supplying the missing affect. Huh? What? I'm worried for you. You don't seem worried for yourself. We'll get to the neurology of that in a moment. Well, what? Nothing could happen. I was with my friend. Oh, oh, I see. Oh, two girls have never been pillaged, plumbed, raped, and murdered. It's only one girl. That'll never happen to two girls. I actually had her. She was like, well, I said, okay. And we had a good connection. You can't work with adolescents unless you have a good connection. Get to that treatment. We did. I said, all right, this is way before Google and YouTube and all that. I want you to look up in the newspaper <laughs> articles about young girls yelling, pillage and plumbing, and all those things. And she did. She came in very proudly. Oh, look at this one. Oh, wow. She was like murdered and like decapitated. Wow. Anyway, so her line was, you know, I wouldn't mind living off my parents if I just didn't have to live with them. <laughs> oh my God, that is, I said that, can I use that? Yes, thank you. That is the bumper sticker for adolescence. <laughs> Independence, but don't forget the dependent part. I wouldn't mind living off my parents. I need you, if I just didn't have to live with them. <laughs> I remember Duran and taking him to Bishop's and driving the, well, I used to have a house but before I met Roy, on C Lane, cute little cottage. He said, Dad, I wish you still had that house. He's about 12, 13 now. He was 13. I go, yeah, it'd be cool. He says, yeah, because I can live there. I'm like, huh? Yeah, I just live there. I said, well, like, who would like cook and all that stuff? Mika. Mika was, he was his like nanny of sorts. You know, Mika would come do all the cooking, do all that. And I just live there. I'd come and see him on the weekends. We go surf and stuff. I'm like, Wow, on the one hand, bravo for your independence. The other hand, I miss you already. But that was classic. This is huge. Huge. How else do they do this? What else do they become connected to so that they can become... But by the way, neurobiologically, that part of the brain, that area, area A of the... Uh, Area 10, area 10 of the prefrontal cortex, and a whole bunch of areas that have to do with self reference, self awareness, is going bazonkaronis. Technical term. I mean, it's going unbelievable. So, their level of self preoccupation, self reference, and self consciousness, everybody's looking at me, I know you're all looking at me. Oh my God, that is neurobiologically imposed by the dictum of their developmental stage. Unbelievable. How any of us get through adolescence, by the time we, I'm going to talk about these various neuro things that are happening, is astounding how we survive adolescence. By the way, you've got to remember, our hardware, for the most part, is 30,000 years old. Adolescents were prime hunters, maters, boinking in the bushers type, at, on the savanna 30,000 years ago. Their brains and bodies, that's what they're built for. But we're not on the savanna anymore. You raised your hand. You were going to say oh, your hand. I was going to say, I think um, during adolescence, maybe a little bit later, you start being connected with your future and recognizing the effects of your actions. Not 100%, but you start realizing that you have to, that there is a future in which you won't be able to rely on You're either precocious or later and later in adolescence. Because one of the problems with adolescence, at least in the middles of it, is the lack of that, unfortunately. But I mean, at some point, you start thinking, I can't wait till I get out of here. Co correct. And that's that, that's that independence. God, I can't get one that works here. Independence drive is the launch factor. Launching is huge. There are two big, biggest launches in our existence. One is called birth. <laughs> Significant change of circumstance. Nice, warm, whoa, bright lights, big city, whoa. Huge. The other is called leaving home. Your childhood is over. That, that's what it was. That's all it's ever going to be. Good news, bad news. If it's good, you're going to miss it. Oh, God. If it's bad, it sucked. I didn't have the childhood I wanted and deserved. It's huge. But the pull towards the outer usually is strong enough 
to get us out. Sometimes that's very hard. Launching is a huge. Haley wrote a wonderful book called Leaving Home about this, the dynamics of the family. It's a really good, it's a great book. You should look at that. I, I tell parents to read it about launching independence. So, of course, the way they do this, of course, is peers. Did you want me to go after another marker? Sorry? Did you want me to go after another marker? That'd be so kind of you. Thank you. Because it would be nice to be able to, at least I could see it. I don't know if it matters to you whether you can see it. Peers, peers, peers. It's all about peers. You show me adolescent is not connected to peers, I am worried. Again, the highest predictor of how well you're doing at 30 is not your grade point average. It's the friends you have. And you don't have to have a huge social butterfly network thing. You have one good friend, okay, good. Tell me, now, he might be in China because it's an online friend that you're playing Minecraft with or uh, Black Ops which is better than none, but I'd rather have you have a three-dimensional, live, in vivo, actual human being that you think you, that you can actually spend time with in person. And yeah, there are Asperger-ish type folk, or really or artistic type folk, who don't, really don't connect in that same way. And their neuro-oxytocin structures and all that is different. Do you know if, if you let them snort oxytocin, they're more social? They are. I don't know if you know that. You can snort oxytocin. Mm -hmm. That's Isn't how. that the nose spray? Yeah. No, oxytocin nose spray. Makes them more social. Try it out on your boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now you're nice all of a sudden. Now I feel so, you're so attuned to me. You're so loyal. There are, in general, actually, speaking of oxytocin, Adolescents actually have a higher level, in general, baseline level of oxytocin, both male and female. And it's all oriented towards Peers, nature's very smart. Your task is to individuate, separate, move away from family towards the world. And one of the biggest ways to do it is through peers. So we're going to jolt up your oxytocin and we're going to aim it towards peers so you can really be interested in your peers. In this whole continuum, remember the we and then the we, me, and then which is, so this is basically birth. There is no me without a we, it's just mommy and I, or caregiver and I, whatever. And then it's kind of like, oh, there is kind of a we, but there is kind of a me. No, I don't want to. Ooh, I have power here. Have, I'm separate from you. And, and latency becomes more and more of that. Kind of a we, me. And then, and then kind of a me, we, is latency is kind of like, yeah, it's about peers and whatever. Well, adolescence almost feels like me, not we. It's like I'm in contra to what you are and who you are. I have to separate from you. And the way to do that is via peers. We end up, with, hopefully, with a me and a we interdependent. We can be interdependent. So your oxytocin is up. Your serotonin baseline, in general, is down. More prone to depression and more prone to poor judgment. As we all know, that brain, that whole prefrontal cortex, judgment, dorsolateral, Judgment thing, general, well, first of all, like plasticity means it goes throughout your life, but it doesn't really consolidate usually until your mid-twenties, not in your adolescence. Passions, never mind for your peers, but adolescence is usually marked by passions about something. You guys didn't mention a whole lot of sports, but most folks do, with teens, get involved in some kind of sport that's really important to them and again, there's a lot of peer stuff involved. Nowadays, they go across the country and sometimes to Europe. My kid went, I believe it was a water polo team from Bishops to Italy. That cost a pretty penny. But it's peers and passions and oh my God, talk about being the causative agent. Being competent. Talk about competency and mastery motivation. Being competent, being great at what you're doing is really important. And they'll get really down if they struck out or missed the play or whatever. And they'll feel so great. They caught the touchdown. And whatever, the dance, all that stuff. Man, competence, mastery, being the causative agent. Huge. Yes? Later now, how late the goes. Yes, and I think it also starts earlier. 
I told you Duran's 13th birthday, right? And the boys were doing arm farts and the girls looked like they were going to the prom or something. And it's nature's birth control, because otherwise if they were equal, they'd be bonking. It's like insane. But they're much... I remember my dear sweet goddaughter, Jessica Elizabeth, McGoldrick's daughter. And when they first moved to Laguna, she's 12-ish, and half of her room was like unicorns and all that, and the other half was Brooke Shields and, and Duran Duran. Duran Duran. Sorry. <laughs> Duran Duran. I'll say your name is going to be easy because it was this group called Duran Duran, but they're going to spill it wrong. On the other half, and by the time I came up again, I helped them move in. By the time I came up a month later, the whole room was all pie. And, and this wonderful dollhouse thing that McGoldick built for her was gone. It was all gone. So I think it happens earlier. Tweeners, oh God. Especially for girls. And it kind of prolongs later in many ways. Uh -huh. Yeah. Remind them that the average person by age 40 has had 16 careers. I don't know if you know that. That's very reassuring when, see, I did a one tracker, as I told you. When I was 16, I knew I wanted to think like a psychologist. It was very easy for me. McGoldrick actually has had five or six careers. It's very, it's very pressurizing if you think, I know it's not a word, if you think at 16 or 17, you're supposed to already now, especially by 11th grade, because now it's a college thing, you gotta write that essay in senior, oh my God, that your whole life is now determined on how you do. You gotta get at least a three, five, hopefully a four, four something, SATs, I say, oh my God, the pressure's insane. And you gotta know what you wanna do for the rest of your life and you gotta articulate it eloquently. What? No, you're gonna do that and then you'll meet somebody and then you'll go, you, who knows what's gonna be at 30. It's gonna be okay. Like 16 jobs or like, oh, yeah. what do you mean? Job, like job, like job. Oh, that you're already thinking about what you, you're supposed to be thinking by 16. Kind of like what you're going to be in life and have a meaning about it. Because you have to start applying for it. You have to write that college essay. That's yeah. So you have to, and you think these kids are unbelievably pressured. Never mind when they're leaving college now. what? Because they realize, I don't know. I'm supposed to definitely know by now. Do you know, um, do you know a, a resource for like a career aptitude? I was looking for this for one of my Mm -hmm. clients. Oh, go I, ahead. I don't. Go ahead. Department of Labor. Okay. Um, just type in Department of Labor and you can take like an online uh, career. Okay. Because um, I was looking online and I was finding all these like silly ones, like Seventeen Magazine. Oh, no, that's right. The, the Department of, and they'll even like, you can make an appointment for free and they can actually go over like your skills. And that's a fabulous resource. Yeah. I don't know if that's fabulous. Oh. <coughs> okay, let me keep going. No, no, that's a great question. That's a, one, that's a great resource. We need lots of resources when you're working with teenagers. You show teenagers, I might have already told you this one, pictures of Matt Saglatz, Garrett, you know, faces showing different affects. FMRIM. You show adults, kids, those faces. Adult and kids, adults in particular, using different parts of the brain. You'd be using different parts of the brain to try and discern what affect is being shown. Teenagers mostly use their amygdala. So they will misperceive and see it more as either angry or frightened in the negative affect realm. And they're misperceiving. So they misperceive their parents. Why are you yelling at me? Why do you look so mad? I'm not aware I'm being mad. Right there, that face. This is called bewilderment. I don't understand why you're thinking I'm being such a grumpo. Well, you are. Now I'm starting to feel angry. You know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> they misperceive. And by the way, I tell teenagers all of this. Let me tell you the brain you have. And I send their parents that uh, National Geographic cover story. I sent that to you, the link to it, so that they learn about this brain they've got. It's got fabulous aspects and got some incredible liabilities. Do you know that their dopamine tends to be lower overall? So what does that do? Ah, oh, here's a nice little simple experiment. <laughs> Love this one. So you're playing a little like computer game thing. It's in research. And you're going to win. Okay, so there's little kids up to age seven or whatever they are, 10 I think it was. Adults, teens. One coin, ten coins of the whole jackpot, okay? Bill Pumpkins are just as excited where they win one, ten, or the whole jackpot. Like, oh, I want something, oh, I want something. It's much more, again, open, orbital, frontal, magic mind, all that stuff. 
adults are pretty much excited in terms of the ratio. They went one ounce, cool, ten acre, jackpot, yeah. <coughs> you know exactly what teens. Teens are totally bummed if they win one. What? Ten's like, eh, yeah, I won the jackpot. I mean, that's a very simplistic experiment, but overall, it takes more of a jump, a jolt to get that yowza. No wonder they'll go down Torrey Pines 103 miles an hour, especially if their peers are next to them going, yeah! Never mind if they're stoned or intoxicated, because their judgment, their future think in general isn't as well established. They, they're much more in the immediate reward what's going to happen right now as opposed to the future consequence. <laughs> Let me tell you about, we'll call her Katie. 17. I loved her. She was she's amazing. Difficulties in school, smoking dope. By the way, it's much harder being a teen now. Well, you, certainly than at my age, but even in your age, it just gets harder in certain ways. And the dope is every, 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 everywhere. But that's a whole other story. So, but she's smoking dope and she's not taking a lot of responsibility for care of herself. And she comes in and says, I love their immunity to death <laughs> or the consequence. Hey, I was with my boyfriend and you know up at UTC, you know, there's that road and there's like this bridge that goes over the road. <laughs> so it has this like, oh yeah, this like fence so that you can't jump off. So we like climbed up the fence and we were like at the top of the fence. It was so cool, man. The cars are like zipping around. And she's saying it just this way. She's just like, this, nah, this is getting my dopamine up. This is really exciting. We're like balancing. I said, wait, wait, wait. You got to be the ego. You got to be the prefrontal cortex for these kids. Because they are. They're like kids right now. So I happen to have a little kind of like carpet thing. Kind of like a peace rug or something. I don't know. So I pulled it up. And I said, let's fold this up. And let me see how wide this railing thing was. So she says, oh, oh well, it was about the size of a foot. So we made the round. I said, so I stood with her. I said, let you stand with me. So we're like, I don't know, 30 feet off the ground here with cars zipping by. And we're on something that's about like this. Is that right? Yeah. So you're like a sneeze away from oblivion. Like, I'm chew, boom, and it's over. Yeah. I worry for you. <laughs> Hello, prefrontal cortex. Come in, please. Judge, man. Where's the party that day? Yeah, well, isn't it cool? I worried about her substance use. Thought she misused. She says, no, I don't. I say, okay, tell me under your definition, when would you think you have a problem? That's a really important thing to ask. If they say, no, just say, great. What's your definition of if you have a problem? If my friends say I had a problem, bring your friends in. I'd have to get permission from their parents, make it clear they're not my client. I want your friends to come in. I'd love to meet them. By the way, it's a nice thing. You can, you got to get permission from everybody. Obviously, the paying parent of the kid and the parents of the kids that are going to come in, they're collateral contacts. Three ladies come in the next session with her. Just tell me about her. Tell me about Katie. Every one of them said, we worry about your drug use. I look at her like, and she drinks and drives. She came in the next time and said, I'm going to put myself into a center. Put myself into a center. Rehab center. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell my mom I got a problem. And that's exactly what she did. Now, that doesn't solve it, but it helps. And at least we get the, the battle clear. The part of her that's taking love of the life of care of herself and the user. What always amazed me when I worked with these kids, by the way, you're going to see the tape today at the end of the day, these substance abusing kids, they never questioned me that using drugs was harmful to them. That wasn't the issue. The issue is they didn't care. That's a different issue. But it always fascinated me. They never challenged me on that. I saw her years later. This was very cool. I was coming up to the mailbox. And, and she looked at me and said, Dr. V. I didn't even recognize. She's this woman now. She said, I just want you to know, it was so cool to have somebody I could go and talk to and tell them anything. And you really did listen. I just want you to know, it's so cool. Give me a hug. I was like, oh, hoo hoo. I will tell you, adolescents, the fragile alliance, they are brilliant at shifting. 
Remember I told you, remember shifting, creating another is your own inner state. You have that one memorized. You have felt it. You work with an adolescent. One moment you are the, you are the world's greatest therapist. I've never been able to tell anybody this. Wow. This, you're really important to me. And you're like, hello? Hello? Is my supervisor hearing this? Because I think I ought to just get my diploma now, thank you. <laughs> I have to do a dissertation. I'm obviously brilliant. Come on, it's really about doing therapy. I'm doing this. In fact, tell the licensing board. Just give me the license. Let's get this over with. I'm ready. <laughs> and what happens next appointment? Oh, they don't show. They hate you. They don't, you're not relevant anymore in their lives. In fact, they've stopped therapy. Bye. What? I thought you were so important. By the way, it's not atypical if you have a really deep session that the next one's like, whoa. Again, if life's about how close we're going to, what's the intensity of intimacy? Too close. It's a fragile alliance. Is shifting like, Please. you know, kind of the same thing as manipulation? I don't, I think manipul manipulation is trying to get one's means in a not direct fashion, I guess. It might be one way to look at manipulation. That's shifting is, it's not intentional. It's really non-conscious. Remember, you shift the right brain, not the left brain. You don't shift ideas. You shift feeling states, perceptual states. You work with adolescents, and the flip side, by the way, you are definitely going to feel at times insecure, like you're an idiot, powerless, helpless, hopeless, you should have stayed with a bowling league. Why did you ever get in the field? It'll be the opposite of just give me the diploma. I'm so incompetent at this. Why did I, and you know, I was a pretty good bowler. Why did I ever give up that? This is ridiculous. Oh, I had one. Oh my God, I'll, I think I've told, again, I don't, I'm so sorry. I don't remember what I've told you or not. So if I agree with I apologize. You, again, you see, we're gonna talk about group therapy in the second half, but this 14 year old, so it's a, um, residential center and running a group and she's new she comes into the group she sits down I say welcome she goes mm, welcome <laughs> I did tell her that one yeah it was unbelievable I did tell her because of shifting because I really totally understood how that mechanism I've never been mocked like that before or since I mean not on a, just every word it was brilliant but it really was a shift and you remember I thought about it I came back and I said this is fantastic you must feel so anyway so yes, they are amazing in their ability to shift and create in you their inner states. Okay, so we talked about they're amygdalated, so they're going to they're gonna perceive their peers as judging them. They're insecure and self-conscious, so they're going to be aware of everything they're doing. And by the way, a lot of times their peers are judging and dissing them because of their own insecurities and having to shift that. And yet, they're oxytoniated to connect with peers and want their peers to adore and treasure them. What a dilemma. What a dilemma. Push me, pull me. I wanted your oh, but I think you don't like me, but I really don't like me. Oh, but I need you. Oh. And I need more to get me thrilling, and I don't have as much judgment. How do we ever, any of us survive adolescence? It's astounding. All right, so implications for treatment. What are the implications for treatment given this population? Talk to me, somebody. Say something. What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? I imagine you'd have to be um, really fair and consistent. Oh, that's so well said. Oh, by the way, that's, I'm glad you said the word fair. That's another part of the brain that's going bonkers. They are. They are. Exercising the prefrontal cortex in many ways. I mean, they are trying. They just haven't myelinated it to other areas of the brain. The, the, the symphony isn't. It's like different parts of the symphony are playing kind of on their own, but they're playing madly. So fairness, principles. They'll get very attached to principles and ideas and, and rock groups or whatnot, or that punk rock is absolutely the most important movement, whatever. Things become really important. And one of them is that whole thing. This isn't fair. And, and again, usually when the kid or, uh, says that, you go, I'm, uh, you're right. I'm sorry. I must be, it's unbelievably frustrating. I know monkeys and bananas and monkeys and growing grapes. I, I know more than you even think I know about the issue of primordial issue of fairness, how primate that is. I'm sorry. And by the way, I usually get lower. I'm not going to get there. Like, I'm like, whoa. Let's, let, let's, let's get the energy a little lower here. 
And if they're getting really loud, what'd you say? Huh? Oh, okay. Placidity, being placid, can be a really useful thing with a napping out teenager. You got to move them out of their brain states. We'll talk about psycho aikido in a moment, but I'll tell you a real quick one. So I'm at Southwood. Again, I might have told you this one. I think I did, actually. Oh, well, sorry. You know what's the end of the class? I'm looping the stories now. <laughs> I try to bring in a new one every, every time. 31, I like that one. That's a new one. So these two are about to fight. It's the end of the group. Everybody's left, and this guy and this gal are about to fight. And I look at the two of them, and I go, oh, ah, ah, oh, ah, oh, ah. They both look at me like, you're out of your fucking head. It's like, oh, ah, ah, oh, oh, what, what, what? And she left. And he stayed. He's looking at me like, what are you doing? I said, monkey man, I'm a monkey. Ah, I feel so much better now. You, you feeling better now? Yeah, you're really weird, Doc. Hey, high five. I swear to God, true story. Oh, yeah, panic is the mother of invention. Desperation. I don't know what the fuck to do. Oh, my God, these guys are about to just attack each other. No, really. And they're big. These are not little pumpkin, you know, three-year-olds or even seven-year-olds. These are big, bulky teenagers with all that muscular. I mean, Savannah 30,000 years ago, get the saber-toothed tiger, they're going to get me. And my karate isn't going to help. I've got to pummel them. So I hope you because you got to change the brain state. But the number one thing you got to do is connect with them. And you're right. In order to connect, you've got to be impeccably fair. And at least own when you're not being fair. That was really well said anyway. And it's not fair. You're absolutely right. And building rapport is kind of the biggest. Correct. So you, in order to connect with somebody, duh, you have to connect with what they are connected to. How else are you going to connect with somebody? And they do see you as a foreign land, especially an old guy with gray hair, for God's sake. You guys have a little more credibility. And I used to have a lot of credibility. Having trust, too, because I think I, I see teenagers telling me things that they think that I might tell their parents, just to see if I will. Oh, well said. I mean, you heard my spiel. I, mean, I gave it yesterday to a new teenage client. Everything you talk about in here is totally, absolutely confidential. You can sue me for my one million dollar liability policy. That's a lot of video games. If I betray <laughs> your trust, which I will not do. Now, by law, I have to report child abuse, facility, anybody plans to murder anybody, anybody's a dangerous self father, which also includes <laughs> domestic violence. You should put that on YouTube or something. Everything else, totally confidential. What your parents tell me is totally confidential to the world. By the way, I can't even say hello to you out in the street unless you're on the street unless you say hello to me first. And you don't have to. It's not rude. That's up to you. I mean, I'm really clear about the boundary thing. What your parents tell me is confidential to the world. But neener, neener, I can tell you what your parents tell me if it's relevant. And, when, and then I bring the parents in at the end. And I do the same spiel in front of the teenager. You've got to build that trust. And I mean it. And I know they have... On one hand, legal rights, you know this one. They have legal rights to everything that you have about their minor. On the other hand, APA rulings, Board of, Mel of uh, Psychology ruling says, if you, are, if you believe it might be in any way harmful to release data on any of your clients, it is your ethical responsibility to assert the privilege of confidentiality for the minor. And by the way, you'll almost always win. The one time that happened to me, the courts immediately sealed the document. You've got to connect. So you've got to connect with what it is they're connected to. You've got to get interested in what in the world they're interested in. Interested in punk? Tell me about punk. I don't know all about punk. Let's go on YouTube. Show me one of your favorite punk bands. I'll take my little iPad. They'll take me on YouTube. And they'll go, oh, yeah, this is this band. I really love it. Wow, cool. Educating me. I got it. You've got to connect with what they're connecting to. Yes? I just remember yesterday, there was an 18-year-old that was an inpatient who was had attempted suicide. Mm. So he was designated as the person to talk to for an individual while he was on the inpatient unit. So he's talking to me about how he had this, his plan was to drive off the coast of the ocean and go into the ocean and die. Um, he had actually lived in Arizona and actually traveled, left home to go to Sea World. So I'm like, interesting how you must be interested in have love for water. That's love really for, good. And, 
And he's like, yeah, I want to be a biologist. And that just turned to a whole different... That's very brilliant. That's marvelous and brilliant on your part. So this right. is how you, you find something that they're... You've got to find what they're into. Because they, they will. Oh, God, they are the masters of the... I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Huh? <laughs> I think music, music, really music is great. By the way, one of the things I say, that I don't know, which is really weird to me, I'll say, so if you did know, what would it be? Oh, well, it would be blah, blah, blah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, some of it's just out of reflex. Sometimes they don't know, especially males. I mean, come on. They're in the, those parts of the brain, between affect and all of that, and thinking and verbalization, are not well myelinated. And some men, they never are going to be. You remember, I think women have like nine areas of the brain dedicated to listening, and how many of the men have? One. And you're thinking that one's usually not working. I mean, I'm sorry to diss my gender here, but it's unbelievable how better set up you are for communications and connections and all of that. Yes, please. Um, I think you have to be like 100% authentic because they can see through you, and you have to speak to them as if you're equals. You're so on the nose on that. That's one of my other big points. I use the word genuine. Authentic is just as good, if not better. You've got to be genuine. And if, you're, if you don't know what to say, say that, you know? I have no idea what to say. Remember the, the one who mocked me? I said, oh my God, you're brilliant. You're unbelievable. I, I teach classes on how to deal with difficult. You're brilliant. High five. Now leave, because <laughs> I do need to run this group. But, and we'll get back to this. But you are brilliant at what you do, because I have no idea what to say to you right now. I don't know how to get out. That, by the way, is not your problem. It is my problem that I don't know yet how to help you be in this group in a way that's productive. I'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. For right now, I'm so sorry. My problem, I need you to leave. And she did, because she won. And she did. I, be honest. You won. High five. Fantastic. Unbelievable. I'll think of something. Hope springs eternal. We'll work this out. And she did. She left with pride. Because pride's really important. You shame an adolescent, they will revenge you for it. Remember shifting? You're going to end up feeling ashamed or very angry, because they're also going to feel very angry at you. Don't humiliate anybody, but certainly not an adolescent. They have enough of their own humility. Humiliation, never mind. Humil they don't have enough humility. The other part of it is they don't have enough catastrophizing. They don't catastrophize enough. And yeah, you're going to get some anxious, very nervous, very over-catastrophizing teenage girl, but more often than not, especially the boys, they don't. Like her, it's like, what's going to happen? If you do this, then this might happen, so instead, I have a guy now. His inner drug part is winning. It's not, he's about to launch and go to college and whatever. And we're very clear about the different parts. And I said, okay, okay, so you planned a deal and all of that. Okay. And he has it all planned out. I said, you, know, you have a marvelous planning mind, but I think it's being used by your inner user, now dealer. So tell me what I'm worrying about. Give me the scenario. Give me the worst case scenario. Oh, he also has a gun. He's going to have a gun. Oh, yeah. My eyes went exactly like yours. Like, what? Tell me your worst case scenario. I have a good relationship with this kid. Hmm. Come on, gun, drugs. Come on, what's the worst case scenario here? Cops come. Okay, we'll go with that one. I frankly was thinking somebody's coming to steal your drugs and you get into a shootout. They die, you die, somebody dies. But okay, let's do the cop one. How many? What do you mean? I just see a cop. No, no, SWAT team. Do you hear the helicopters? I mean, come on! I gotta help the prefrontal cortex there get an image because they don't catastrophize enough. Sometimes. But you can only do any of that if you have a connection with them. You can't do anything if you don't have a connection. And, and yes, please. So if you're trying to help them develop their PFC about those yeah. situations, yeah. do you find that if the rapport is good, that they're usually, do they buy into that? Do you just kind of let them think about that? Or what's kind of the next step after exploring those? Let's, we're going to go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say a little bit more, and then I'm going to go into what I call psycho Aikido, which will kind of highlight exactly, because that's step by step, because that's a great question. And I do believe, I do think there's, I mean, just to answer at least a piece of it, there is the plant, the seed phenomenon. I mean, it's a pretty visceral image, SWAT, and you know, wah, 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 boom, boom. Now, again, it's raising their dopamine, so part of them is like, oh, that sounds exciting. I, I get that part. But they don't really want 
to have a shotgun blast in their face. That is not, they don't want to be body parts on the ground. You know, it's so, it, it's tricky, because it does kind of like, but, you, but I think it does, I hope when he goes to college, I hope he actually doesn't get a gun. He doesn't have a gun yet, he wants to buy one. I hope he doesn't, and I hope, he, I hope that scene or something helps him. And I do stroke his judgment anytime there's anything that's positive about it, even within the context. Remember, you're a tradeologist. Even though you don't like the context, he is doing a lot of planning. He's missing a certain factor, but he's also there, like this setup and that. Okay. Okay, so we talked about being genuine. And if you don't know what to say, say you don't know what to say. Tell them what you'll think about it. Ask them what would be a good thing to say to you now. I don't know what to say. What would be a good thing for me to say to you right now? And sometimes they'll come up with unbelievable things. Or say to them, okay, you know exactly what I'm going to say. What am I going to say? Or oh, you're going to say da 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 Whoa, the first three, yes. I didn't think about the, first, the last one. That's the best one. Yeah, that one too. If you can get them in the playful mind, they do still like to play. They aren't that far away from Orville Frontalville. And they will do sometimes Sam Worlds. And they will sometimes even sit in the big teddy bear or the big ape's lap. Because they do have the dependent part. Don't mind living off my pants. They still do have that. And you'll sometimes see, or the pants will see sometimes at night, when the PFC, when the defensive kind of go, and they get little again. And they love that. OK. Let's talk about Psycho Aikido. Aikido, as you may know, is a form of martial arts. And there is no enemy, only an uneducated other. And your job is to educate them, which might end up with them on the ground, pinned, but you're, they're not the enemy. Psycho Aikido, I think is that's about. I, I just made the term up because it just seemed to me that's what's going on. You use their own energy to re-educate them, so to speak, is the concept. They have moves and whatnot. It is a martial art. It's kind of jujitsu. So I don't know if it's striking art. So here's the thing. Again, adolescents are brilliant at shifting. Adolescents will challenge you. They will say things that are ridiculous, and you're going to go, oh my god. They expect you, ah. They expect you to confront. If I had one gesture for adolescents in terms of when they move into this mode, it's simply this. They're in your face. And you can't make me. My suggestion is it's very rarely, if ever, useful to do this. Do this. <laughs> Take that energy and move it over here. So that's what this is based on. So I'm at Southwood, inpatient hospital, adolescent, substance abuse. 17 year old who was, um, he had an option go to juvie or go to the substance abuse inpatient unit. He chose that one. Thought it'd be easier. First group. He lasts about eight minutes. It's like, I'm out of here. Gets up. Big African American kid. Gets up. I'm still running the group. Staff comes in and says, hey, um, he's leaving. <laughs> he's packing his bags and he's going to leave. Um, so could you please um, attend to this? <laughs> okay. I go, and there he is. He's got this paper bag, and he's putting clothes in it. And I say, I see you're leaving. He's expecting me. What do you think he's expecting me to say, by the way? Absolutely. Very good. Wow, the chorus. By the way, the Stones had the Cal State chorus come up on stage. <laughs> I saw her tonight at the reception. You can't always get what you need. Ah, oh, that's so cool. Sorry. You know, the mind is only three synapses away from a whole different world. <laughs> you can't make me. You can't make me. So what am I going to say? That's the last thing I'm going to say. That is the last thing I'm going to say. He's going to think exactly that. 
We're going to have four guys on you 24-7. You're not going anywhere, blah, 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 blah. I'm leaving. So, of course, the first move in Psycho Aikido is agree. Agree with the possibility, all capitalized, possibility, not that they should do it, but with the possibility that they can do, can do, whatever it is they just said they're going to do. It's the first thing out of your mouth. And it's very counterintuitive. Because, yeah, you, your inner parent is going to say, what? No, you can't. Your amygdala is firing, right? You're either going to get defensive, critical, contemptuous, or avoid. You're gonna, no, yeah, I'm going to get you. I'm going to pin you down. I said, let's be really clear. Of course you could leave. Are you kidding? Let, let me be. And again, they're feeling insecure. They're feeling trapped. They're feeling helpless. They're feeling hopeless. That's what he's feeling. So I got realistically, genuinely, because they will sniff out if you're being disingenuous right away, and they hate it. No, oh, God, you're just a phony. And they'll look at you with all that contempt. Oh, my God. Talk about little uh, Jay in that tape where he goes, huh? He's a pre-adolescent that way. Adolescents will just destroy you with a look. Ugh. And you're like, oh, God. <laughs> oh, it's unbelievable. It's so contagious. So you agree, and you've got to be genuine. Let me be very clear. If I didn't have these keys right here to the unit, yeah, this is the one that gets, yeah. He turned and looked, which I want. Again, I want him to shift brain states. He's in high amygdalation. He's not in logic mind. It's all or nothing. It's never. It's always. Remember, field of vision gets narrow, literally, attitudinally. You're on the savanna, and the saber tooth coming after you. You got to race out of there. You won. So uh, let's be very clear. That's it. You've been here how many days? Why am I asking him this question? How many days have you been here? Prefrontal cortex, it's a number. Why am I to think of a number? Three. Oh, okay. Let's see. I think it's 1,500 a day. Holy schnoly. That's 4,500 bucks. You've been in here. Yeah, 4,500 bucks. Okay. That's 4,500. So I'll bet you. I I'll put it in writing. I'll put it in writing right here, right now. You got a pen? No. Good, because you're not supposed to. Ah, that was a test. They <laughs> cut themselves. I'll bet you 10 times, 10 times what the county has paid for you to be in here. That's $45,000. That, if you leave, and again, let me be very clear. You've been on the streets since you were how old? Well, man, I, like eight, but then I was back, you know, you know foster homes, and basically 12. All right, so you've been on the streets basically since you're 12. Oh my God, dude, I'm just this little white kid, grew up in La Jolla, California. I have no cred on the streets whatsoever. I'd be swallowed up, man. You know what it's like out there. You know how to get out of here. Are you kidding? There'll be some window. You're like, oh, maybe you'll smash it or whatever. And I'll set up some alarm or whatever. Or you'll just wait. You'll wait and look. You know, there's a staff opening the door. Yeah, you'll bolt right out of here. So I'll bet you 45000 There's no question. No, actually, I'll hold that bet. There's no question you can get out of here within, what do you think? I don't know, 91 seconds? It certainly wouldn't be more than, it wouldn't take you more than three full minutes. Because that door is opening and closing, no question about it. Me, I'd be like, oh, I don't get out of here. Oh, throughout the key. I mean, it's true. It's all, by the way, I'm speaking truth. I mean, I figure it out. I could run for the door as well, but not like he could. But here's the problem. So I agree, not only with the possibility, I find some trait in him, traitologist, that says why he could do this that's positive. You're very competent. You're very street savvy. You've grown up learning how to watch for little things that I don't even know to wear. I've had that luxury. I've been protected. You haven't. It's amazing. You're 17. You survived. Man, you're on the streets when you're 8. Then you're 12. It's astounding your ability to survive. That's awesome. But here's, so, so here's the thing. Here's the $45,000 bet. I bet that within 24 hours, 24 hours of you leaving here, you're going to do something that's self-destructive. You're going to steal. You're going to smoke dope. You're going to have unprotected sex. You're going to get into a fight. You're going to do something. I guarantee it. 24 hours. That's going to be self-destructive. He did not argue with me. What he did say, which is interesting, because it kind of bypassed some of these steps. But we'll get to these steps. He said, I don't care. I said, ah! Next step. Amplified empathy. Amplified empathy. I don't care. I say, well, let me be very clear. 
No wonder you don't want to be here. Holy schnoly. You guys, uh, you're, you're, you're on the streets. Jail, not a pretty place, and that wasn't the first time you were there, Juvie. You are told when to wake up, when to go to bed. You are told basically what you can wear or not. You are told what you're going to eat and when you're going to eat, within some choice, but basically. And furthermore, everything in your life in here is therapy. Oh my God, there's morning group therapy. God knows you have the somebody who's therapy group with me. There is um, individual therapy. There is movement therapy. There's rec therapy. There is uh, art therapy. There's fucking breathing therapy. Everything is therapy. You must be going out of your fucking mind. It's unbelievable you've lasted three days in this place. I'm astounded that you've been able to last three days in this place. It must be like breathing in cement. It's insane. So you do amplified empathy and you gotta mean it. It's gotta be genuine. It's true. If you think about it, if you really go into their shoes and amplify it better than they ever could, you articulate their world much better than they could. You're smart people with verbal skills and a heart. I get it. I really do get it, by the way. You are a hero to be here. The bind is, as you nicely put it, if you do go. So this is the Agree that they can do it. Amplify empathy is why they would want to do it. Now, what would the negative impact of what will happen in detail if they do what they plan to do? He already said, I, I gave him the bet that you're going to do something else. So he just agreed with me because I don't care. I say, okay, that's the bind. I don't know you. But here's what I did see. And you were in that group for like nine minutes. When Kathleen was talking about being raped, I looked at your eyes. And you had this look of like rage and pain. Like she was your sister or something. And you were like, how could somebody do that? And I thought, wow, this kid has a heart. And again, I don't know you, but wow, you've got this heart. And you've got this life that you led out there and you still have this heart. I believe, and I could be wrong, but I don't think I am, you deserve better than to be dead on the street at some age in the next year or two. Or never mind, even the things I just listed to you, I believe you deserve I believe you don't know that, and I believe it might be useful to stay because we might help you discover that you deserve that part of you that takes such great care in such a destructive way to take great care of yourself in a way that gets you a life you want. And I don't even know what life that is, but I bet it's not dead on the street at 18. I bet it's not that life. I'll bet more than $45,000 on that. But you decide, not right now. I'm going to go. By the way, I'm not going to put five people on you. He stayed. He stayed. I don't know whether he's dead on the streets or not, but he stayed. OK, so the first move, you agree. Let me give you another one and give you a couple, because I want you to get this. Because your reflex is going to be, no, you can't. You've got to say, wait, i got to agree with them. They could do this. So. so impact um, just having them describe. Yeah, I'm gonna do it on I'm gonna do it on this next one. Little, he jumped, so it made it easier in a different way. He just said, yeah, I don't care, I'm gonna do some negative thing, because I outlined it. Mm -hmm. But you generally have to outline details. So here's the next one. Then I'll outline detail. I'm I happen to see on the outside a kid individually had some uh, substance abuse issues, he ended up inpatient at, at Southwood. So I saw I was also treating him individually. While there, I would see him individually in David Bergman's office, who was the director. Wonderful psychiatrist, great guy. Very nice office. You know, wood, as pictures, night, all that stuff. So we're sitting, we're chatting, and, and he goes, I'm not going back to the unit. I said, oh, I think your parents are coming for like a family session or something. Yeah, 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 I'm not going, I'm not going back in the unit. Now, of course, the temptation is, like, yeah, you are. Well, we're going to get you. <laughs> So I go, well, let's see, you're, you're, you're a strong, feisty kid. I can, I can well imagine. Wait a minute, I can well imagine. And tell me again why you don't want to go in the end. Because the place sucks, and I hate it, and I don't want to meet with my parents. All makes sense. All makes total sense. In fact, again, I, and I do, I am amazed that they last as long as they do a lot of times. Because they can run. I'm amazed. I do think it's your healthier part, but that's a bias on my part. So, so, let, me, so let me be clear. Um, there is no way that I could or would physically pick you up. I mean, are you kidding? 
I mean, you're, you're, but you're wired, you're strong, you're going to be all over the place. So obviously I'd have to get, how many, how many people would I have to get if I was going to haul you out of here? God, how, what do you think? You said about eight. <laughs> I said, that's cool. So, well, actually, let's run this, let's run this play for a second. So it'll take, who's on, who's on today? So he starts listing the people. Now, again, this is pre-final, right? This is detail. This is numbers, names. Charlie's on today? That guy looks like the linebacker that the Chargers should have had. <laughs> oh, I'm relieved. What part of you do you want him to grab if we're going to bring him in here? You should grab the leg. So I started having him outline each person. I said, and wh which part of you should I grab? You get the head. Oh, great. So I'm going to hold your head, and then you're either going to bite me, ah, or you're going to spit in my face, tooey, 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 or sneeze on me, up to. I'll do it. I'm committed to you. And then let's imagine the scene. What do you think? You're going to knock down at least that lamp over there? Probably. And you'll probably try and grab the photo there on your way out. And you're going to be screaming and swearing. I mean, this is, wow. And the, all the staff's going to be looking out. Mm. And then we're going to get you out of this building, because it's a building. We've got to walk you across the plaza. And the kids, oh, they're doing the, the wreck thing right now. So they're going to be like, whoa, and they're going to all come up to the fence. And you're like, yeah, look at Benny. Benny's being carried. Well, he's got eight guys, including Charlie's guys. Oh, he just kicked Charlie in the groin. Oh, man. Ha, ha, there goes Charlie. You know, uh, detail. And then we get you in, and let's see, if you haven't come yet, oh man, the rubber room. You know, we got that room, we do, we had, this is all true. I'll, do you want, we, can we orally administer to you the hell though? Because we're going to have to give you a calming agent. So can we give it to you? Probably not, because you're going to be spitting by left cheek or right, I swear to God, left cheek or right cheek, I promise you I'll give you the choice as to which butt cheek you'll get the injection. By the way, what's for dinner? What's the plan tonight? What's for dinner? I remember this really clearly. You said the Chinese food. I said, you know, I got to say, the food generally here is about as bad as my cooking. Great pancakes, the rest sucks. The Chinese dish is probably their best dish. What's the plan for the night? It happened to be video night. So you guys get to choose a video? OK. So big scene, brr, bum, butt sheep, bum, out, or Chinese food, movies. I'm going to go chat with your parents, and then I'll come back. Don't, don't move. I go out, and of course he moves. Of course he comes out. And then he comes, I love this moment, he comes to the door of the inpatient thing and starts knocking. Says, hey, come on, let me in. Hey, Volcani, get me in. Mm -hmm. I love saying, I know, this is like neener, neener. Hang on, I I I'll be there in a moment. I just have to talk to your parents. <laughs> 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 By the way, this doesn't work all the time. Of course not. But you have a much better chance. <coughs> because I do believe there's the part of you that wants to take love and wants to respect. And I'm trying to get that. Remember the Italian stallion, right? The guy who's going to be dead in OB or else become a banker, mm -hmm. right? I want that's my guide, the inner part of you that I'm going to team up with against your darkness, okay? Psycho Aikido. I'm going to go to LA. You know, I'm sick of living at home, and I got this plan. See, um, see, I, 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 I'm going to go with a. Well, I'm going to meet a friend up there. And um, he, he's got an uncle, and this uncle's got a really good friend who owns a taco shop. So I'm going to get a job in the taco shop. And I mean, I got a plan, man. I've got the whole, I, 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 I mean, it's going to be really cool. What do you say back? Um, well, yeah, it so sounds like that's possible <laughs> that you could do that. Um, I'm sure LA sounds really exciting. You probably thought about you know, what you're going to do, where you're going to stay, what your life is going to be like. Explain to me, like, what it would be like. Perfect. I mean, you're doing really well. I mean, first, you agree. I would, I, I would even say you could absolutely do that. And not even it's possible. You could absolutely do that. I know you've got the skills of savvy. Again, you're looking for positive traits. And then you're going to start outlining the specifics of that life. So the taco shop, by the way, you like Mexican food? 
Well, it's kind of, okay, so it's kind of stinky, greasy to you? Yeah. What are the hours? You know, you start getting life in the detail. How much do you need to live? You know, all that stuff. Which isn't this, you're going to say something. Well, I was going to say that recently, I actually had a client who, who told me she was going to run away. Yeah. And, and I ran away from home when I was, when I was a kid. Okay. And, well, you can um, leave life experience. I know, and I did decide to tell her, you know what? I thought I had it up figured out too. But this is what, you know, the other things happen. So explain to me, and I, I did ask her, explain to me in detail, like, what right. is it going to look like? Like, what's right. your life going to be like? You know, exactly. You and you look for the positive, and you look for the negative, and you look for the different parts. Part of you wants this, part of you wants yeah. By the way, I've also helped kids get emancipated. Yeah. A few. I remember one where it actually worked, where the kid was, it was so tense in the home. I, and when we gathered together, I said, you know, maybe you really need to get an apartment. You're 17, and you guys are about to get to fists and cuffs. And dad, if he works, will you give him a buck for every honest buck he earns? Yeah. Okay. And we actually said the irony was he spent more time than at home once he got his apartment and all that. He was a senior. Mm -hmm. And he'd come home for dinner. He'd come home with the wash. I mean, that whole thing. It created enough distance this way that he could have more closeness that way. But, but I'll say, well, let's look, at the, you know, let's look at the budget. You want to live on your own? Yeah, I'm sick of living. How much do you need? And it's usually about two to three grand. That's what you need. If you have an apartment with a bunch of people, it's at least 500 grand. I mean, you start doing the numbers. You start getting real with them. Well, this it, was 14, so. Yeah, and that's not going to happen. For her. <laughs> and you do have to think about danger self other. Yeah. Remember that? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But how to, how to respect them, because they are very sensitive to any of that. But remember, and I do remember one time at St. George, good old Job, and he stood at the door. I'm not moving. You're going to have to take me down. I'm not moving. And I tried everything. And he really wanted to be taken. And his, his eyes were like little, it's interesting. You'd think they'd be dilated. You'd think he'd be because of nerves and getting more stimulus. He didn't, they were like little pinpoints. I even said, wow, you, you are in an altered, you take something because you're in an altered state. Because you're, I, so I said, OK. And we got a bunch of people. And then we, I said, again, which part do you want who to hold what? And he kind of, and then we took him down as gently as we could. There was no way to move. Him. But when I was at Southwood, one of the things that would bother me is that staff would say, hey, I need you to come in. They'd go, fuck you, I'm not doing that. Staff would say, that's an hour room time right now, man. Get in your room. Fuck you. That's too, and you just watch it escalate. And within 31 seconds, literally 31 seconds, now we've got code blue or whatever you called it then. It wasn't code blue. And a bunch of people are all climbed up. And I would try and train the how do we de escalate. It's a very tough population, but it also can be very gratifying. Please. How does this uh, work with patients who are horribly psychotic, you know, in terms of talking about the consequences? Like, do they ever get more escalated when they... I wouldn't, I don't know that I would do this with a horribly psychotic. I, I, I tr it depends. I usually try to go into what... I do differentiate. Well, I have, you know, one guy in particular is just schizophrenic, and he. But I've differentiated from, for him, the, your magic mind has a light and a dark side, and when you move into the dark demon sides, this guy believes there's demons and all that stuff. Dad, I'll deal with you on those demons. Let's see how we can help you with the demons. Let me be clear. I think it's part of your. Marvelous magic mind, but it's the dark side of that magic mind. I don't think there are actually demons out there, but I could be wrong. But I'm going to help you with that within that context. But I know your sane brain, because I've seen your sane brain also, knows that that's a figment of your imagination, but it doesn't feel like that. But let's go into that dark world. I mean, I'll work with the dark world. I'll, 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 talk to the, I'll talk to the figure. Remember the guy I tried to give the Rorschach to in the prison or in jail here? He had Ekta, whatever the name was of this. It was a huge rooster that he was hallucinating. So I gave the Rorschach to the rooster. I got to argue with that. All right, Ekta, what do you see here? Now, psychotics, are, you know, and they do need neuro meds, I believe, unless you have a very unique setting and you want to do the dark sea journey and you believe that that might transform them, like we did at South, I mean, at uh, St. George's. That's different. I want, pre I want to be able to affect the prefrontal cortex that's there. 
It can be enormously gratifying. It can be enormously uh, frustrating. It's cool when I remember one just really sent me a picture of her with her baby. And she's still a teenager, but she decided to keep this baby, and mom and her teamed up, and even dad came back. They're divorced. And, and it was cool. And she sent me a little photo and said, here's me with my baby. And that was, that was cool. But you can, you can connect with them, and they can remember you. OK, any questions? We're good? We're going to take a break. We're going to come back. We're going to do group. OK, take a short break. I'm so sorry. Sorry? That's number four. Oh, is there four? The four is the good news of, oh, I'm so sorry. The good news of what would happen if you do do what's the better thing. Thank you for staying on that. When I said, what they doing for dinner? Thank you for, oh, Chinese food. Oh, they have a movie. So you, that's the positive option of what they can do. Thank you for such good tracking. Jeez. <laughs> what they can do if they don't do what they plan to do. You got to end on the positive thing. But then you leave them up to the choice and which part of them is going to choose. But I always tell them it's the parts. And I always make the negative part of that dark part. But yes, tell them what they could choose. How do I know? Thank you. Go take a break. Bring you back, please, at 20 after. Because I really want you to see this tape. Thank you.